Find in your Bible, in the New Testament, the book of 1 John. We've been in the book of 1 John for quite some time as we're studying through this New Testament book of the Bible. I love systematic exposition. What I mean by that is I love studying through books of the Bible. And I do that almost exclusively on Sunday nights because I believe there is incredible value inherent in the text. I believe that God put that text right there in the Bible, and I believe that God put those verses in that order, and it benefits us greatly as we study the text of Scripture. So tonight we come to 1 John chapter 3. We've worked our way pretty much halfway through, if not a little bit more than halfway through, the New Testament book of 1 John in a study that I've entitled Authentic Christianity. Authentic Christianity. And so we've been been encouraged to live faithfully, to live soberly, and to live powerfully in Christ in the midst of a dark world to shine our lights. John's reminded us of the true and authentic message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's reminded us of who Jesus really is. And we saw last time how we've been saved by grace and how that radically changes us and transforms everything that we do. And now tonight we come to 1 John chapter 3 verses 4 to 10. And I want to talk to you about this subject, dare to be different. Dare to be different. Read with me from 1 John chapter 3 beginning in verse 4. John writes, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared, he, you might want to circle that right in the margin, he, meaning Jesus, of course, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this... It is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Remember tonight, the power is in the perfect word of God. And in reality, John really doesn't pull any punches to describe to us what it means to live a faithful, consistent, godly life in this present day, to walk with Christ and what it means to really be a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus. I remember when we lived in North Georgia, we were in uh, Forsyth County, up in the northern part of Forsyth County, close to Dawsonville. How many of you ladies have ever been to the Dawsonville Outlets? Hold your hands up. Anybody ever been to the Dawsonville Outlets? How many of you husbands have been dragged to the Dawsonville Outlets? Anybody? Yes? See? See a few hands there. Dawsonville, up in North Georgia, great outlet mall, Tanger Outlet Mall up there. We lived in in an area really close to to Highway 53 in Georgia 400. There was a community not far away that was a kind of a a really nice, uh, out-of-the-way, almost a retirement community, but but it was a very well-to-do area. It was a a community called Big Canoe. That was the name of the town, Big Canoe. And it was a beautiful place. The setting was kind of like mountains and, and a lake, and it was just a gorgeous place. And I remember driving down Highway 306 one day, I saw an advertisement, a billboard, for Big Canoe. They wanted you to buy houses. They wanted you to buy property and build houses. They wanted you to move to Big Canoe. But the interesting thing about this, it had a beautiful picture. There was a mountain and there was a lake and there was a beautiful, wonderful scene. And then as I read, as I read the billboard, something struck me as very odd. Up at the top, it said Big Canoe, advertising that location. Then down at the bottom, it said four words, shh. Don't tell anyone. And as I read that advertisement, I thought, now this is strange, right? You're going to pay a lot of money to advertise on this billboard next to this busy highway. And you're going to put a big billboard with big letters, big canoe, with the message, don't tell anybody. Anybody else get a mixed message there, right? doesn't work like that. But as 
As I begin to think about that, I begin to think that in, in reality, that is the way that many Christians live their life. We send mixed messages. I mean, we, we will come to church and we'll be a big advertisement. And we'll put on the church face and wear the mask and we'll say, Yay, Jesus, go God, I'm on the team, man, amen, hallelujah, that's good to go. Then we go out in the community and we're like, shh, don't tell anybody. The reality is, if we're going to be faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, the lives that we live ought to be the greatest advertisement for the Jesus who saved us. We ought to be transformed and we ought to be telling everybody of the life-changing message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we sending mixed messages with our lives? Do we act like Christians in church, but then act like it's a big secret? in other places. John challenges us here to dare to be different. And can I just say tonight, I want you to hear me with all the love I have in my heart. Different doesn't mean weird or crazy. The quota for weird people is already filled, okay? Right? That different doesn't mean weird or crazy or the, the person that makes everybody nervous when they come up. Different means a life that's been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here in 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 to 10, we see several reasons we should be different. Number one, we should be different because of the principle that God has established. The principle that God has established, we see that here in verse 4. God has given us a principle in His Word. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. That's what John says here in verse 4. And so God has established a principle. What, what is a principle? A principle is, here's the definition, a fundamental doctrine or tenet, a distinctive ruling opinion. The Bible has many principles, many standards. They all, they all come from the character and the nature of God. The principles that are established in the Word of God derive from the character, the nature, and the will of Almighty God. And John shows us this principle. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Now, don't, don't miss this important distinction. Now, maybe in your translation, as you read your Bible, it says everyone who sins or everyone who commits sin. But literally in the Greek, and it's well represented in the English Standard Version here, literally in the Greek, the indication all throughout this passage refers to a continual process of living in sin without a desire to change and without an openness to correction. That's why the English Standard Version defines it in English as makes a practice. In other words, it gives the idea that it is the continual habit of your life to live in sin without any desire to change or to fall under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. This is a fundamental principle in Scripture. If you live in sin, you live as if there is no law. You live as if there is no lawgiver, the Lord Jesus Christ, and our Heavenly Father. So you live as a lawless person. That's exactly what this verse is saying. If there's no law, then I don't have to abide by it. If there's no law, I don't have to live by it. And if I live my life any way I choose, I live as if there is no law and as if God himself does not exist. Everyone who breaks God's holy standard is guilty of sin. But those who continually sin, willfully, happily, live as if there is no God at all. In fact, the greatest sin of mankind is idolatry of self. Living as if there is no God and living as if self is God. Doing what I want, when I want, because I want. We all struggle with the greatest idol in our lives, the idol of me. The idol of I. What I want, what I wish, me, my, and mine. There's a clear principle that God's established. We should dare to be different because God has shown us here, right here in verse 4, whoever makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. In other words, it is breaking God's law. In fact, one of the words for sin in the New Testament is the word transgression, trespass. It means to step over the line that God has drawn. We all do that. We see the line, we know where the line is, we want to get as close to the line as we possibly can. We want to step over and then look up at the heavens and see if God actually saw us step over the line. Everyone who 
makes a practice of sinning, practices lawlessness. There are universal principles all around us that cannot be denied. There are principles in math and science and nature and marriage. Here's a mathematical principle. You ready? This is real simple. Two plus two equals four. Somebody said five. <laughs> Funny. Two plus two equals four. I know we don't have math class here at church. Pastor Matthew might start offering that as discipleship course. 2 plus 2 equals 4. A scientific principle, E equals MC squared. Now, I don't know what that means, but I know it's a scientific principle. A nature principle, the average distance between from the earth to the moon is 238,857 miles. Here's a, a marriage principle. Happy wife, happy life. Yes, yes. These are principles, and there are principles all around us that cannot be denied. And God has given us His standard. He set forth a principle in His Word. When you break the law of God, that is called sin. And when you continue to sin, you live as if there's no God. And you may be thinking tonight, well, I'm doing pretty good. God's established His law. I'm following His law. Let's let's just take a moment and examine our lives compared to the Ten Commandments. God's laid out. People call it God's top ten, right? God's laid out in uh, the Old Testament, His Ten Commandments. One of them on there is do not commit adultery. And you say, well, we're doing pretty good. You got that one covered. Maybe you do. But Jesus says in the New Testament, anyone who lusts after another in his own heart has already committed adultery. So we're guilty. Then there's another one, right? Do not commit murder. Thou shalt not murder. I don't think... We have any murderers in here tonight, I'm looking very closely as I'm preaching. But Jesus says in the New Testament, if we hate or have, or have animosity towards another, if we have hatred in our heart, that we're guilty of murder in our heart. In other words, God's standards show us our inability. We are utterly incapable of meeting His perfect standard of righteousness, therefore showing us we're in desperate need of a Savior. We should live holy and faithful lives, a clear principle in Scripture. When we break God's law, we continue to sin. We act as if there's no God at all. Second reason we should dare to be different, because the price that Christ has paid. The fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, loved you enough that even while you're a sinner, He came and died for you. The fact that He shed His blood for you ought to motivate you ought to challenge us to live faithfully and to follow Him. John begins here and says in uh, verse 5, You know that He appeared in order to take away sins. Now, of course, I told you a moment ago, the He refers to Jesus Christ. He appeared in order to take away sins. He refers to Jesus. That word appeared is very interesting in the original language. The word appears refers to the incarnation. It refers to the birth of Jesus Christ. In other words, John is saying the very reason that Christ came was in order to take away sin. And you may want to circle the words take away. Fascinating word in the original language in the Greek. It means to lift off. It gives the idea of there's this heavy burden on your shoulders that you cannot bear and then someone comes and picks it up and takes the burden off of you and carries it themselves. He, Jesus, appeared, came in the flesh in order to take away sin. The sin debt that we owed, the burden that we carried, that we could not handle on our own. Jesus knelt down and reached out. To us and lifted the burden off of our shoulders and placed it on himself at the cross. That's what God did for us. That's the price that he paid in order to rescue and redeem us. We ought to live lives differently as a result. The purpose of Christ's coming, the purpose of his life, the purpose of his death. What's it for? To take away sin. So here in, here in verse 4, four he says, everyone who sins practices lawlessness, guilty. But then verse 5 he says. Christ came to take away sin and to take away that guilt. We ought to live different lives because of the price price that Christ paid. See, he gives us two major reasons why Christ came. First, to take away sin. And then again in verse 8, to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came so that we might be forgiven and the enemy might be defeated. How about that? Man, that ought to give us Hope 
That ought to give us joy. That ought to give us a promise and a future. There's no reason for us to walk around all pooch-lipped and pouty and whining and complaining. No matter if your team won yesterday or not. No matter if your candidate won or not. In the end, ultimately... We ought to have joy because of who Jesus is and what he's done. We can be forgiven and the enemy will be defeated ultimately through the cross of Jesus Christ. Both of those things happen at the cross. Both. So we can be forgiven. Sin is lifted off and taken away. And the enemy is defeated. We should be different. We should be changed. We should live separate holy lives because the price that Christ paid in order to redeem us and to rescue. We've been purchased. Paul says, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Don't get confused when you read this passage. If you, if you walk through this passage, verses 5 to 8, you can get confused because he talks about in verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. And you may look at your Christian life and you say, man, I, my, my Christian life is the story of one failure after another. I fail every day. And then, and then he goes on to say at the end of verse 7, whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Then verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of, of the devil. Now that can be incredibly convicting because, you know, I, I'm the preacher, right? But, but I know that just like you, I struggle and stumble as a result of sin. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I struggle and stumble just like everyone else. And so as you read this, you're thinking, how in the world do we have hope and do we have a future? It sounds like John's saying that if we sin, we don't know Jesus. Don't get confused, but this is the same guy that said in 1 John 1.10, if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So John recognizes that everyone is a sinner. And if we say we haven't sinned, then we're lying. And remember why the book of 1 John was written. It was written to Christians to give them confidence in their faith. I've written these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. It was written to give tests that we can apply to our lives. The test of light versus darkness, love versus hate, truth versus error. These tests that we can lay over our lives and see if we're faithful followers of Jesus. So John is not saying if you ever stumble in sin, it means you're not saved. That is not what he's saying. He's saying if you continue to practice unrighteousness without being convicted, if you make it a practice to live as if there's no God, if it is the habit of your life to continue in sin without falling on your knees in confession, you need to check your life to see if you're genuinely saved. This ought to be an encouragement to believers who get a good whooping every now and then when we fall and stumble like we should. But it ought to be a warning to many who think because they walked an aisle or prayed a prayer or got dunked in the water that somehow, even though their life didn't change, everything is going to end up okay. John says to them, if you think you know Jesus, but you can sin without being convicted, you're of the devil and not of the Lord. That is a powerful word. But those of us who know Christ know doesn't mean we'll be perfect. And John recognizes that and says the very same thing. Doesn't mean we'll be perfect. It means we'll stumble, but when we stumble, we confess, we repent, and we receive reconciliation. John's not teaching perfectionism. He's teaching a spiritual doctrine called sanctification. Now, these are Bible words. These are words we don't use a whole lot anymore. But I think we need to remember the Bible uses these words. Man, we ought to know what these words mean. Sanctification it is the process of being made in the likeness of Jesus. Salvation, you know, is in three forms. I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. Past, present, and future. I have been saved. Justification. In other words, I have been made right in the sight of a holy God. I am being saved, sanctification. I am being made each and every day, renewed in the image of God through the power of the Spirit that works in me. And one day I will be saved, glorification, when everything that God has done and is doing inside of me comes to fruition and I live perfectly in His presence for all of eternity. That's what God is doing in your life. Man, we ought to live differently because of the price that Christ paid. You ever purchase something that doesn't work right? 
seems to be a trend in my home, especially for electronics. Things just don't work right. And in my house, it's like when one thing breaks, everything else starts breaking around it. It's like they all got together one day and said, we're going on strike. Let's all break tomorrow, right? And then everything begins to fall apart. And, and typically for us, it is like the week after the warranty expires, you know? Oh, we got this. It's on warranty. No big deal. Oh, by the way, sorry, Mr. Purdue, but your warranty expired 12 hours ago. You ever feel like that? It is frustrating. It's frustrating when you purchase something that doesn't work right. It doesn't work properly. I want you to know, for those of us who know Christ, we've been purchased by his blood. We were bought by his sacrifice on the cross. We should dare to be different. Commit to live a godly life. Sell out for Jesus. I wonder how frustrating it is for him when he sees those whom he has purchased. But they're not doing right. They're not living like it. I think of men in the Old Testament like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel who stood up for the sake of their creator. In the midst of oppression, danger, and fear of death. I think in the New Testament of men like Peter, James, and John. Who were willing to do whatever it took to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to make a difference. You see, the cross ought to motivate us to live differently. Can, can I just say tonight, you, you cannot encounter the cross without being affected. You will not encounter the cross without being changed. Now, it may change you for the better. You're transformed by His grace. Or it could change you for the worse. And you walk away from grace. We ought to live differently. The principle that's been established, the price that has been paid. And then third, we ought to live differently because of the power that the Holy Spirit provides. We see this in verses 9 and 10. Now, again... John's continuing with this theme. The theme is about those who practice sin, who make a practice or a continual habit of sin. John says here that we, we should not continue to practice sin. Why? Because God's seed abides in us. He mentions the new birth. Let's, let's look at verses 9 and 10. They won't be on your screen, but hopefully you've got your Bible with you. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Verse 9. For God's seed abides in him. Now, I, I want to make that distinction again. Makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. Here it is again. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. You see the distinction. There's this group who continues to practice sin who may say they're of God, but John says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they're not. And then there's this group who practices righteousness. This is the group that is of God. So over here, you have people that think they may be right with God, who think they may know the Lord, who think they've had some type of religious experience. But they continue in sin relentlessly, without conviction, and without confession. Man, you know people like this. We see people like this all the time. They've got their name on Southern Baptist Church rolls all across this country and world. We have over almost 5,000 members at Second Baptist Church. People whose names are on the roll who don't ever show up. And John says, you've got all these people who believe that everything's okay because of one moment in time in their life. But there's never been a change. They've never been transformed. They're no different than when they were before they said they met Jesus. And they're living as if their eternal destiny is secure because of one moment that made no difference. John says, how can you keep on sinning and living like that, thinking you've got fire insurance and your free ticket to heaven? In reality, it is those who practice righteousness. 
Let me be clear. Not those who are perfect. Because everyone's disqualified. But those who practice righteousness. In other words, the desire of your heart is to earnestly seek after God. Do you stumble? Absolutely. Got skint knees? Absolutely. Always needing help up? Absolutely. But when you need help, you run to Jesus. John says there's a clear contrast here. And so we know that we're children of God. How? Because the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. Christians can sin, but they cannot sin successfully. Can I say that again? Christians can sin, but we cannot sin successfully. There is always that point of conviction. There's always that moment where the Holy Spirit of God peels back the layers of our heart and pierces us to the very core. There's always that moment when God chastens and disciplines His children. Yes, we sin. But we sin in such a way that ultimately leads to confession and repentance. There's an old saying, and I don't know if I'm going to get it right. Christians lapse into sin and loathe it, hate it. Lost people leap into sin and love it. Well, that's the difference. That's the difference. This is what John is saying. It's clear here he's talking about the new birth. Here he he mentions being born of God. The same phrase, same idea used in John chapter 3 when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and says, you must be born again. What does it mean? It is regeneration. I'm born again, but not to myself and not in the flesh, but now the Spirit of God lives inside of me. And the seed that John refers to here, that God's seed abides in him in verse 9. That's the Holy Spirit of God that now indwells a believer and that seed continues to bear fruit as we grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's referring to the work of the Spirit of God in concordance with the Word of God in our life. In other words, we're different because of the new birth. When we experience new birth, we have a new hope. We have new desires. We have a new passion. We have a new direction. We have new wishes. We have new dreams. John says those who are born of God can't keep on sinning, can't continue in the same pattern of sin without conviction and correction. Then John gives a final word. He shows us how to identify those who've been born of God and those who haven't. Who are those that are the children of God and the children of the devil? In fact, John reminds us here that there really are only two families in the world. That's it. The one with God as the father and the one with Satan as the father. Those that are the children of God and those that are the children of the devil. See, if you don't live a life of righteousness, if your actions haven't changed, if you can't look at a moment in your life where you've been transformed and changed by God's grace, then John says you are not saved. It's that simple. Now, John is writing to encourage Christians about how they can know they have genuine faith. But the test of authentic faith, authentic Christianity, reveals those who are inauthentic, not genuine. So as we apply this to our lives, John says, here's a word for you in verse 10. By this, it is evident. Circle the word evident in your Bible. It's evident those are the children of God and those are the children of the devil. It's evident what family you belong to because you bear a family resemblance. In other words, stop sending mixed messages. Be who you are, who God has created and recreated you to be. You are either of God or you're of the devil. That's exactly what John is saying. A life empowered by the Holy Spirit will be different. Tony Evans says this. I love Tony Evans is one of my favorite preachers and has the best stories and illustrations of anybody I've ever heard. Here's what he says when it talks about the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Most people get where they want to go by car. The power, the force in the car takes them where they want to go. All the person has to do is position themselves correctly. In other words, if the car is in the garage and the person is in the house, they may have what they need to make the trip, but they will not be located in right relationship to it. 
The problem is not the individual's inability to make the trip. The problem is they are not in correct relationship to the, de- the thing designed to bring them to a certain location. Many times we stay stuck in the Christian life because we're not in the right relationship to the provision, to the force, to the engine that God desires to get us where we need to go. It's not that we don't have the power or know the guidelines. The interesting thing, here he says, the interesting thing about grace is that God has put the motor inside of you. It's called the new nature. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The motor has already been planted in you. All you must have is the proper alignment in relationship to that power. In other words, the Spirit of God is in you. You've got to position yourself in the right way to experience His power. And he says, if our lives are not functioning properly, it could be that we don't have the power the Holy Spirit provides in us. You see, ultimately, God has given you everything you need pertaining to life and godliness. Period. Everything you need, He's provided for you. Everything you need to follow Him. Everything you need to be righteous. Everything you need to, to show a life of faithfulness, light, love, truth. It's inside of you. The problem is not that we don't have the power in us. The problem is we don't avail ourselves to that power. Every temptation you face, God has provided a way of escape. Every one. And when we stumble and fail, it's not because he did not provide the way. It's because we chose to go our own way. So now the Holy Spirit of God indwells us. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. The Spirit of God leads us and empowers us. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witness. Notice this. The Holy Spirit of God changes you. He makes you different. If you're a child of God, you're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Dare to be different. God God has saved us for us to make a difference for the kingdom in this dark and sinful world. He's placed our church right here for us to make a difference in our community in this dark and sinful world. But the reality is you can't make a difference if you're not different. If you continue to live like the world and love like the world and walk like the world and talk like the world, how are you going to affect any type of change you're going with the flow? In order to make a difference, you've got to be different. You've got to remember the principle that God's established. The price that Christ paid and the power of God, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. That gives you the guidance, the power necessary to walk with Him and to bring God glory.